is meant to be interactive, not at all formal, and really not going to be a, we're going to throw a, a, a load of studies at you today. Um, so really the, the big <coughs> goals are to talk about antibiotic stewardship, um, a little bit of the why, a little bit about a systematic approach to managing impaired therapy and antibiotic therapy in the intensive care unit patient. And so I just wanted everybody to think about um, what does antibiotic stewardship mean to you? If you had to define stewardship, what does it mean? Don't over prescribe. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? Uh, everybody's part of it. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, so, so, so I think we would like to think of stewardship as, as a comprehensive approach to, to the use of antimicrobials. It's not just don't use them or always use less of them, but to use them optimally, to use to go big and broad when necessary, but also to, to optimize. Um, it's a system of people, epic guidelines, and probably a lot bigger than, than any of us really um, individually. Um, so I guess at the, um, the, the core of stewardship is that we are at least in some element talking about limiting antibiotics and, and why. Um, so when you look at literature on antibiotic use from the 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000s to now, it's kind of depressing in that we really haven't got better. And so you'll see in the literature this uh, reported 30 to 50 percent of all antibiotic use is inappropriate or unnecessary. And that trend continues to today. Um, the Centers for Disease Control did a, a survey just a, a few years back now and published it in the MMWR in 2014. They evaluated antimicrobial prescribing in 32 <coughs> various U.S. hospitals and looked at two key uh, things. Uh, one, patients who were treated for a urinary tract infection that was present on admission and noted that in 16% um, six, of patients, there was a no urine culture even ordered, even though this isn't an inpatient, it's generally considered standard of care for an inpatient treatment. Um, in addition, in over 20%, or at least one out of five, no documented symptoms were present in the medical record, suggesting that these were possible asymptomatic bacteriuria treated completely unnecessarily. Uh, vancomycin IV, um, as a pharmacist, this is of course near and dear to my heart. Um, so they evaluated 185 patients in their little snapshot um, and found that about 20% of the time, Cultures returned with no growth for any gram positive, but patients were still continued on vancomycin beyond 72 hours with really no regard for that culture result. Um, less common but still concerning is about 5% of the time, cultures demonstrated MSSA, um, yet patients were continued on suboptimal therapy with vancomycin, which we have a huge body of literature to support. Is uh, increased with associated with more mortality and, and just worse outcome. So just briefly, the, the big picture goals of antimicrobial stewardship programs are to optimize antibiotic use, both at a population level and in an individual patient, to improve outcome safety, minimize resistance, and minimize cost. Uh, specific to the intensive care unit setting, um, we could probably spend an entire hour talking about the variable effects of critical illness on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and how difficult that makes to um, not just drug dosing but optimal management. The other uh, big piece here is reduced susceptibility to antibiotics tends to concentrate and be more prevalent in the ICU. So I brought copies of um, both the medical ICU antibiogram for this uh, campus and then underneath that is our um, outpatient antibiogram. So just a, a quick refresher on how antibiograms work. Um, our microbiology lab generates these once a year. So any organism that has at least 30 isolates, it's the first one that's present in that particular setting. So the first isolate per patient admitted to the, to the MICU 
and actually obtain during their time in the MICU. Uh, the outpatient antibiogram, on the other hand, would be anything that was drawn in the emergency department clinic setting. And so I know you see a lot of those patients um, admitted through the emergency department and then uh, come to the MICU. Um, but focusing on the MICU, because that's where things look, I guess, a little more drug resistant. Um, and starting with uh, E. coli, which is one of the big gram negatives we think about covering empirically. Uh, ampicillin and sulbactam, and also ciprofloxacin, um, tend to be pretty poor empiric E. coli agents. So you can see um, three bars on, on here, the dark purple, 2011, the green is 2013, and then the, purple, the lighter purple is last year. So you see a little bit of trend over time. We've remained relatively flat, but ceftriaxone and carbapenems continue to be our best E. coli drugs. Any thoughts on what's the most reliable beta-lactam for Pseudomonas in the MICU setting? Ceftazidime. Anybody else? Cefepime. I think I heard a Zosin. Okay. Um, so throughout the entire system, cefepime is probably the best anisugamonal if you look kind of as a, the entire system as a whole. That said, we've seen some interesting trends in pseudomonas um, in our MICUs here at the Detroit campus that I think have some big implications for, for therapy selection here. Just a reminder, um, as trianam is no longer reported on our antibiograms, um, we tend to niche that for the management of kind of those patients with a severe beta-lactam allergy. But just a reminder, the last time we did report as trianam on, on our antibiogram in 2011, it only covered 40% of pseudomonas, so it's really not a pseudomonas drug on its own. Cefepime has retained um, reasonable activity, about 80% from year to year uh, in recent years. Similar with meropenem, roughly about 80%. 80 um, and in the past, Piptazo fell a little lower than cefepime and, and uh, meropenem in our MICUs. But we've actually seen a really, really nice uh, return in susceptibility, approaching 90% last year. Um, which I think has important implications for your initial selection. When you are going to use a second drug, tobramycin is displayed here all the way out on the right, and uh, that retains activity roughly against 85-90% of our pseudomonas in the MICU. And Acinetobacter. Uh, fortunately for us, we don't see this a ton. Um, most of it seems to be kind of Kind of more of a cyclic thing, hang out in the, the nursing homes and, and burn unit at, over at DRH. Um, but really the key thing here is that there are no good empiric options. We've seen dramatic declines in the last 10 years in our acinetobacter susceptibility. Ampicillin, sulbactam from about 60% down to around 50% now. Meropenem has bounced around a bit, but only about 40 to 50% are gonna be covered there and tobramycin, uh, not reliable, only covering about seven out of 10 this past year. So, um, thinking about uh, some implications for your antibiotic selection in the medical ICU, um, number one, quinolones are inadequate. And I think you may have noticed that we tend to have a pretty quinolone sparing approach to antibiotic therapy throughout the health system. And there are a lot of reasons behind that one of which is it, it just doesn't cover very many E. coli. Um, two, uh, beware the ES, uh, ESBL E. coli. Um, so in the MICU and throughout the hospital, about one in five to one in six E. coli are now extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing E. coli. Um, one of the big, um, I guess, mistakes that I see make, made clinically is the assumption that something like cefepime or even piptazo are gonna add a lot um, in comparison to ceftriaxone empirically, uh, when really you should be considering empiric urtapenem in a community onset infection. So to cover for that ex extended spectrum beta-lactamase producer, 
which is probably a bit more likely than a community onset pseudomonas. Uh, within the MICU, you guys are a little different than the rest of the system, and so Zosin probably should be one of your first line agents uh, that you consider. Cefepime is great for a lot of a lot of pseudomonas throughout the system, but seeing those trends, um, there's reason to think that that it may be a little more favorable choice. That's going to give you a little better probability of that upfront coverage. And then beware acinetobacter. When you have that hospital onset infection with a gram-negative diplococcus on gram stain, you're suspicious of acinetobacter based on gram stain, based on the prior history of acinetobacter. Um, consult ID, consider empiric combination therapy, possibly combination therapy that includes a polymyxin like colistin. Any thoughts there? I see you raising your hand. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of the, the classic squeezing the balloon. We've actually seen some pretty decent, um, I think, increase in some of our E. coli susceptibilities, or, or sorry, our pseudomonas susceptibilities for quinolones too. Um, back when I first, and I didn't include it on this slide, but pseudomonas when I first arrived and we didn't have all that much of a formal stewardship program, probably was a 50-50 shot against pseudomonas um, in the health system. Most recently, we're kind of back up to around 80%. So it's similar to cefepime, meropenem, and piptazo, but we still keep it clamped down given the low threshold to res of resistance with quinolones. So just two to three point mutations and you lose a quinolone. And it um, also can be shared on kind of mobile elements that have things like extended spectrum beta-lactamase producers and, and KPCs. So for that association with clostridium difficile, we, we still don't like to keep quinolones because we know it'll be gone like that if we start using them a little more um, freely. Other thoughts or questions? Mm -hmm. seem, seem pretty clear. And then I'm can they build resistance to sourcing? They can. So, uh, so AMPC is really the most reliable agent for an AMPC that has not been derepressed, or, or even one that is derepressed, is um, a carbapenem, so erdapenem, meropenem. Uh, Cefepime will induce an AMPC, but is relatively stable and, and so can be used to treat. Um, but other agents like piptazo, um, narrower generation cephalosporins are, 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 are not quite as stable. So phagobactin is probably one of the wimpiest of, of beta-lactamase inhibitors out there, honestly. So it doesn't really add a ton to piperacillin other than some anaerobic activity. Um, so any, you know, kind of bigger, nastier uh, beta-lactamase is unfortunately not doing a ton for you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, when aren't empiric therapy guidelines help, helpful, I guess, is, is taking a step back to like the 10,000 foot view. So we don't routinely recommend double, co double coverage in the setting of, all right, we can use one drug and get about nine out of 10 um, pseudomonas. If you have any reason to think that somebody is in higher probability for a drug-resistant organism, or sometimes 80, 90% probability of getting it right isn't good enough because your patient's in septic shock and on pressors, and you want to be 100% sure. So adding tobramycin up front makes a lot of sense in that setting, and that is generally what we would advocate. Um, I don't know, other thoughts? Yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe if you've done it 10 days, and then maybe that's, that's the only thing you told me. You're done. Now the patient's just calling us. But I think the, the big picture body of literature, and there are multiple studies, meta analyses, combining the combination therapy data, and the setting of a known susceptible organism, monotherapy is, is very reasonable. Um, Except with us treatment. <laughs> 
So if you have to use S3N, you've got to use a better black yeah. You've got to use a new black side because it's the crap. And I would go one step back and say, really try and get a history of what the reaction is. And we've got a big initiative going with guys, our ID fellows and the allergy and allergy fellows, looking at, because we all take a crappy allergy history. And often by the time you see them, the patient can't give you a history anymore. But you know, we do things like, is your mother living? Call your mother, find out what the reaction was. I mean, we'll actually do that in the room. So it's very important because if you if someone says pencil and algae, you're now scared to use any beta lactam, that cuts out almost everything we have that's any good. And so you're left with his glycoside, really, because he has treatment just along for the ride. It's probably not doing a darn thing. So I think in, in the setting of documented susceptibility, you can feel very comfortable that the literature literature supports monotherapy. The, the two places where I get nervous and I think are gaps in the literature are um, in the setting of no, no source control. Those cases drive me crazy. There's no antibiotic in the world that is going to successfully treat something that has you know, big honking abscess, big leak um, that, that's contributing to the infection. So those are places where I would consider combination therapy because I think you're gonna breed resistance with, with monotherapy. But I don't know that that's gonna ultimately impact outcome. Um, the other place where potentially I think about adding a second drug and what's sort of being advocated now in the HAP-VAP guidelines with <coughs> sort of minimal data is when you're getting into like last line agents like a polymyxin. So it's now sort of being advocated based on the PKPD um, that in the setting of an aminoglycoside or a polymyxin use for a HAP-VAP patient that you would consider combo with inhaled and intravenous therapy with those to kind of optimize concentrations at the site of infection purely based on PKPD because all of the inhaled um, antimicrobial studies are, are pretty definitively negative. So that's sort of way too long answer to your point. <laughs> awesome. I don't forget one or two doses of immunoglycoside when you're not sure and you wait. Yeah. not up front. Uh, even in the kidney study. It's probably not going to do much. It's going to be around for a while, but it's not going to adversely affect the patient. So better to err on that side yeah. than to, you know, I don't think you can, anybody can remember a case where we said, oh my God, you gave them a dose of amino glycoside up front. That was bad. Mm -hmm. Most time they were like, oh, that was a good thing. Yeah. All right. So just some, how to think like the pharmacist who's antagonizing the crap, of you, the crap out of you on the team questioning your antibiotic choices. So the way that we're thinking is just trying to be as systematic about this as, as possible. So one, what are my most likely organisms based on the site of infection that you're telling me is relevant? Are there patient specific risk factors where I should be considering something might be more resistant to some of our first line <coughs> agents like cefepime and Sosin? And then what's the best available evidence? Um, in the world of ID, that's not generally big, giant, randomized controlled trials like it is in the cardiology world. But we do have some evidence to, to help guide our, our guiding principles, whether it be some pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, data or, or maybe a, a cohort study. So we do have empiric therapy guidelines that hopefully you guys know where to find them. If not, we'll come back to this um, at the end. Um, and just a caveat, these are intended for use when no pri prior microbiology exists um, to guide antimicrobial therapy um, or there's no prior clinical history to help guide your antimicrobial <coughs> therapy. So this is not intended to uh, mean more than, than any individual's clinical judgment. Okay. That's the, yeah. So, uh, So that's an important point to make. Um, our, our guidelines are tier one. So they incorporate data from the antibiograms of the entire health of the entire health system. So for example, if you go to Macomb um, and you're in their ICU, cefepime is far and away their best anti-pseudomonal throughout the hospital. It's gonna cover I think like ninety-two percent of the pseudomonas there. Um, just as good as meropenem and dosing is maybe just a few percentage points less. Um, so this, these generally have several options 
um, that incorporates what we think is best practice, national guidelines, and also local susceptibility data. It does not get it all the way down to the unit level. That'd be cool if we could have like P2 recommendations and Henry Ford, NICU recommendations specifically. There are, there are, there are a few differences where we stratify and pneumonia is a big one where we do stratify. We think there's a bigger um, margin of error with empiric therapy and the need for pseudomonas and MRSA coverage versus give them a, a, a cath regimen um, in the setting of pneumonia because they're just not as sick. Um, we do have, depending on the severity of illness, um, adding an aminoglycoside for, for your septic shock person um, and also just kind of probably going bigger and broader based on the general body of literature that early um, active therapy is, is associated with mortality in, in a population like yours whereas that hasn't really been validated in like a floor setting. So you might, you know, go rationally broad, but not cephapine, zosin, and milpenem up front in these other settings. Does that sort of get at your question? Yeah. Okay. I mean, your patients are different, so don't forget, you know, Henry Ford's big strategy is getting patients transferred from other patients. So a lot of your patients that we see on consults have been in a healthcare setting for a month, yes, so two months, down. six weeks, you know, and so they've seen every antibiotic known to man and God already. So those patients are going to be different, and your choice up front is going to have to be much broader mm -hmm. than somebody who walks them off the street to the GPU. Even the GPU patients who get transferred to you, they've already been exposed to all the stuff that Henry Ford has to offer, all of our flora and mm -hmm. fauna yeah. is available for those patients. When they get to you, they're different. They're not the same as a GPU patient. And somebody coming you know, from home straight to the ICU, that's a different patient than somebody who's been there for a while. So. I mean, you both like the situation in the, in the GPU. So mm -hmm. You do. So yeah. uh, the rationale of uh, choosing the antibiotic should be different, or is it the same way? It, 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 is, it is based on the same systematic, the same I mean systematic like approach. Like, okay. yeah. yeah, but yeah. we would go less broad. So in a GPU patient, you got time. You know, the patient's stable, so they've got a fever, so they've got a white so now You've got time to get cultures. You've got time. The patient's not crashing. You've got all the time in the world. That patient doesn't need antibiotics immediately. That patient, you can wait until you get cultures back or until you're sure they have an infection. Whereas your patients, if somebody's in septic shock on three pressors, you know, I'm not going to say to you, well, gee, I don't know if you should use the big guns. You know, maybe we shouldn't. I mean, of course not we're going to say you use the big guns. You have to because it depends on what we're looking at all the time. We're looking, just like Rachel showed that rational approach. Where's that patient been? What's the background of that patient? Were they on antibiotics at home? Were they in another hospital at home? Have they been in the hospital six times in the last three months, in which case we know they're going to have more resistant floor? What previous germs did they grow? That's what, when you get an ID consult, you're getting all of that in one. You're looking at all of those factors to help you make decisions up front about your patients. So your patients are not simple. Very rarely we see a patient that just comes from the community and we go, oh, wow, set tracks, I'm probably going to be helping you. You know, it's not very common. So, yeah, the approach should be different to a GPU patient. It should be much more aggressive and nicer, especially an unstable ICU patient. Having said that, you guys do still get some stable patients, but again, you can take a step back and say, oh, they're perfectly stable. Um, so, let's figure out where the fever's coming from before we just give them more antibiotics. Anything else before we transition into some cases. Okay, let me highlight some cases that have different points that you've heard <coughs> many of us talk about already. Um, but things that come up, like I know when I'm rounding, different questions that you guys have. So we just picked some cases that we thought would be of interest to you. And, oh, where's the thing in Rich? Um, no, not so much. Sorry. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. So I can't use this? I can, but I have to go here. Otherwise, now I can use this, right? Okay. So this is a 29-year-old woman who comes in with shortness of breath. Can you see? Sorry. Yeah. Block out. Okay. So significantly, she's had two miscarriages recently, and she's currently, oh, thank you so much, currently pregnant. Okay? And then she calls EMS in the morning because she's acutely short of breath, and she's got left leg pain. I mean, this is like a very straightforward case, I would hope. EMS found her hyperventilating. They gave her oxygen. She started complaining of chest pain. Might have been pleuritic, actually. Um, and then she went into PEA arrest and was resuscitated with one round of CPR and pushes of, of uh, pressors. So what, what, uh, what's the diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, P. 
So um, what might you expect to find on her, on, on her vital signs when she came into the hospital? Yeah, she's going to be tachycardia, isn't she? What about things that, that ID looks at? I'm sorry? Yeah, she's going to be febrile. And so, you know, be very, un especially the bigger the embolus, like often the bigger the fever. But one of the things I hear frequently from, from um, the ICU and actually from the GPU is it couldn't be a PE or, or a DVT because the temperature's too high. So patients, the quads don't know how high the temperature's supposed to go, right? It's an inflammatory reaction. So some people can get really rip-roaring fevers with this. 40, not uncommon, 39. They get tachycardic, they get hypotensive. They can look terrible. But this is not a bacterial infection. So, you know, they look sick. She gets anticoagulated. And of course, she gets put on vancomycin and cefepime. Now, this is where <coughs> I want to bring you back to what's so important is taking a history. So I know you guys, I, we see your patients, I know they're intubated, I know you can't talk to them. It's so important to talk to the family. What's the history? Here you've made the diagnosis on the history. You didn't even need this slide, right? You knew what the diagnosis was because you got the history. So it's really important. So somebody who gives you that history doesn't need antimicrobials because they've got a big PE. And that accounts for their fever and their tachycardia and their hypotension and their, septic and their apparent septic shock. So that's somebody that doesn't need empiric antibiotics because you have an alternate explanation. So how many times do we do a consult for one of your patients with fever and we say, well, it doesn't look like it's an infection, do a Doppler, right? How many times have you seen, I, I know I said that a lot, and how often do they have a DVT? Really often. In fact, I think ID diagnoses more DVTs and PEs than almost anybody else because it's a very common cause of fever and leukocytosis. So you can also get a rip-roaring leukocytosis. Remember, it's an inflammatory reaction. And if you're young and healthy, you should object to having a PE. You should have a white cell count and you should have a fever. That's an appropriate response. So that's the first case. So any questions about that? So it looks like sepsis, smells like sepsis, but ain't sepsis, it's a PD. Okay? So here's a, a lady transferred from a nursing home with, in, with increasing confusion, a very common patient that we see, you guys see. Um, she's got a history of Alzheimer's disease and two-day history of cough, fever, hasn't been in the hospital recently, no recent antibiotics. She's only oriented to persons, so you can't get a good history from her, but you might try and call the nursing home and find out what happened from one of her caregivers, that would be helpful. And you can hear crackles in both of her lung fields. And you've got a chest x-ray that shows bi bibasal infiltrates. So you put on cefepime and vancomycin with pharmacy to dose. And three days later, she's perfect. She's extubated, which not perfect, but she's extubated and she's doing well. And here's this new thing that we're all seeing, right? This new have you all seen this? Because I know a bunch of you have been asking questions about it. So we used to report sputa. If the lab looked for pseudomonas and, and staph aureus before, there was no primary <coughs> organism, the lab would report it as commensal flora, which just means crap that normally hangs out in the respiratory tract and nothing to be concerned about. So we added this comment because people then would say to us, well, how do you know there's no pseudomonas or, or staph aureus? How do you know? Did the lab look? So this tells you, indeed they looked, they were always looking, but now they're telling you they looked and there's nothing there, okay? So for some reason this comment has caused more, like we, we thought it was obvious, but maybe it's not. It's caught, oh, I had really like really bright people. You know, not, nobody's stupid here. Ask questions like, what does that mean? It, it means what it says. So you can be sure that the lab has, has looked, there is no MRSA and there is no cinema. So that should be a very reassuring comment to you. It, it makes me feel very warm. I get a warm glow when I see that. Okay, and then also she's got a urine culture here and she's got greater than 100,000 CFU per ml of Klebsiella and it's, ooh, it's an ESBL, okay? So knowing this and knowing this and you know it's clinical history, what's going on with this lady? Yeah, she probably aspirated, right? That's, that's, and you know that because she got better so quickly, it's in her lower load, she's a nursing home lady, she's confused probably aspirated and she got better mighty quickly, okay? So, um, what do you want to do about her antibiotics? She's on bank and separate. Yeah, so you, you've got lots of things you could give her that is not separate. So she doesn't need acetamolar coverage, she doesn't need MRSA coverage, right? Even though she was sick at the beginning, it was reasonable to start her on a combination that covered it, you know now you don't need to, okay? So you can rest assured this woman did not have <coughs> either of those organisms. Now, what about the CSVL? What's her, what did she come in with? What was the history? And? Did 
can you go back? Cotton fever. So what do you make of this? Got better without treatment. Okay, so what are the indications for doing a urine culture? Let's go back a step. Mm -hmm. Why was this urine culture done? Oh, that's a urine. That's a urine, I'm oh, sorry. No, this is this is pee. Sorry. We don't get a hundred thousand God, I hope we don't. Um, so it's a urine. So why why would what what would be the indication for you for doing a urine culture? Yeah. So she had mental status changes. So the caveat to that is with no alternate explanation. You have an alternate explanation. She's got ripperine pneumonia. You, her history proves it. Her x-ray proves it. So she, this woman doesn't need urine culture. Shouldn't have had a urine culture. And now she's got a urine culture, and you guys are definitely going to consult ID and be very worried because it's in the STL. Mm -hmm. So now what should we do about the urine culture? Now you got it. What are you going to do? I'm sorry? Get a UA. <laughs> so, by now she's got, so she's got a Foley catheter in there, right? Because she's in the ICU. So if you get if you get a UA, what's it going to show? I, I, I know you meant by UA, it's not. Right. And you stuck a Foley in her. So most people get pyuria, right? So it's not going to help you. So again, it comes down to this urine culture was unnecessary, and it doesn't matter what it grows, because she's got asymptomatic bacteria. So remember the indication for urine culture is mental status changes without an alternate explanation. But you've got an alternate explanation, so she shouldn't have had the urine culture done. And that decision should be made before you grab the urine culture, because it just confuses things. So I can guarantee you this woman would be on Ritipenem for this reason, right? And obviously she needs to go into what isolation? Contact. Contact isolation to protect other patients from us spreading the germ to other patients. But she doesn't. She didn't need the urine culture, and she does not need antibiotics to cover this. So I'm not saying not to give her antibodies for pneumonia. No, I'm not. I'm saying if her UA was positive, that she came from the and she had fever. She was coughing. And she aspirated. She, she was a nurse, she but again, remember, Hoffman's razor, so most people have one infectious disease diagnosis, not two. So, and the history is that she, this is the history, productive cough and fever, right? So productive cough and fever ain't a UTI, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them don't, but a lot of them do, and a lot of people got MSC urine cultures. And, a, and you know that's our big campaign last year. So before you get a urine culture, think about it. Is it going to change what you do, or is it just going to confuse you? And in this case, it just serves to confuse. So the woman does did never need the urine culture to begin with. And frequently, you're not even getting them. being done in the, you know, in the ED. We're we're addressing that. So how well, that's what they say. So, yeah. She could have, but again, going back to one thing, so most people who, so if you have a urinary tract infection that is so severe that makes you aspirate and makes you lose your mental status, you kind of be really, you have an upper tract infection, which is usually very obvious clinically. Right? Cystitis doesn't do this to you. Cystitis, you shouldn't have any fever. You shouldn't be systemically unwell. So even if you're a lady with dementia in a nursing home, you, should, you shouldn't be so sick that you become a kind of an aspirate from the cystitis. So this woman has an aspirational moment, and she does not have a urine. Okay, so like I said, just think about the patients that if you have another explanation, you don't need to fuss about the urine culture, whether or not you obtain it. The other reason to be careful in the ICU is every patient that you do urine culture on, I know Dr. Alan Godwin has come and spoken to many of you about this, if you do urine culture in the ICU and the patient has a fever, by CDC definition, which is a terrible definition, that is a caudium. That is counted nationally in our database as a caudium. Whether or not the patient has endocarditis at the same time, the fact that you've got a urine culture that's positive, may have fever, that meets the case definition for a urinary tract infection. It has nothing to do with their clinical status, right? They don't have a urinary tract infection. They've got endocarditis, which you're treating them for. They've got MRSA in their blood. They've got a big vegetation. If you get a urine culture, it counts against us as data for the national database. So in your setting, if somebody deteriorates, you don't want to do the old pan culture. You want to look at them, examine them, 
and see what you think is the most likely diagnosis. And it's very often not the urinary tract. If you have a patient decompensate from the urine, they have to have an upper tract infection. It's not cystitis. It's not going to be just what goes in the urine. They're going to have a rip roaring pyrrole or terrible prostatitis or a big epididymal I'm sorry? Even with old uh, patients? Even with old patients. Old patients, young patients, cystitis is a very limited disease. It's just a bladder. Okay, so it's way over diagnosed and way over treated. Question, this patient, how would you treat Now we have culture negative, and now we have urine, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, urine culture that mm -hmm. we, we don't think that this is the source. Right. But so how would you treat an aspiration pneumonia that doesn't have MRSA and, and uh, pseudomonas? So I mean, like, now we have culture negative. <coughs> you don't, well, right. So a lot of pneumonia is culture negative, right? Mm -hmm. But you know that it so you're probably going to treat her for pneumonia because she's coming to the ICU, she's sick, she's got pulmonary infiltrates, she needs, she, and I, you know, the difference between chemical aspiration and when it becomes bacterial aspiration, I am not wise enough to know the difference. So I might give her, you know, she wakes up and she's good in three days, I'm like, okay, it's aspiration, so we're going to give her a short course of antibiotics. But I think everybody would give her some antibiotics. Mm -hmm. The question is what to give her, you, there's lots of choices to so she's aspirated. What, what are some choices for aspiration? Yeah, some people might use Clinda, some people would use Unison. Some people might say, well, hey, she's colonized with an ESBL. Maybe there's an ESBL there. Maybe I would give her a penum. There's lots of choices to do. What if she was given antibiotics to bank testing and then it's being a patient? Yeah, so that's the thing. Even if you saw well, that's the thing. So that's the argument against it. So the argument that I would put back to you is the earlier you get the cultures, the better. So if this was, you know, she, she aspirated, you got the, she was intubated, you got the culture right away, and she only had 12 hours a day of antibiotics, I'd say, oh, I'd be really confident that was correct. If, on the other hand, she was really sick and you got the cultures four days later, and she'd already been on Vanco and Cephalopin, then I don't know. So it's up to you guys to get the cultures early. Just like anything, you want blood cultures early, you want to them as early as possible before it's all messed up by the antibiotics you're giving. Not urine cultures early, unless they have reason to get a urine culture. Okay, something like 60% of national urine cultures are asymptomatic bacteria, and it's a leading cause of unusual, of, of possible acquired infections. And if you look at, you know, you guys have all seen untreatable infections in your ICU, because we see them. Untreatable. And I know that we've all shared a couple of patients that went into hospice primarily because we were flat out of antibiotics. And that's because of us using antibiotics inappropriately. It's not because the patient did it. It's because we have given antibiotics either appropriately or inappropriately, you're still going to breed drug resistance. So remember, you're going to run out of antibiotics. So you really have to be very cautious with every patient, and the decision to start antibiotics and what to use should be taken as seriously as one, one of the hospitals <laughs> says, as deciding whether you're going to anticoagulate a patient. It should be that gravitas of decision making, because we are running out. There just aren't any antibiotics left. And we see patients, I used to see, when I came, I was here, I think here seven years. So when I first came here, maybe once every three or four months we'd see a, a germ that was pretty resistant. Every time I round now, we do two week rotation, I see at least one, usually two, where I'm being very creative. I speak to Rachel, what weird combination of antibiotics can I use? What are the least resistant antibiotics? I'll do extension infusion times. I mean, that's common. That's just what one ID person is seeing, and you're seeing them. And they're almost all in the ICU. Yes? So this, and I think that's where the question the most of all is also mm -hmm. pretty much rules out immersive pneumonia, and it's pneumonia. Yeah, there there are studies to show that. If there's a if culture negative pneumonia, why this is yes. not a culture negative pneumonia? So, 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 okay, so you, you're going to have, uh, like, why get cultures at all then? You're not going to believe it, right? No, it's not, I'm not believing it, but I mean, is there, like, something, is there, there like, data, is there something? Yes. Like, yes. There's, a, there's no mess of pneumonia. Yes. I could tear it down or whatever. Yeah, so it's telling you the patient, it doesn't tell you the patient doesn't have pneumonia, it's just telling you that those organisms are not present, okay? So you should be reassured by that. It's an early culture, and it's a good respiratory culture, right? She hasn't coughed this up, it's a good, and you can tell it's good. She's just got a few cells, she's got moderate payments. It's not a bad specimen. So you can be confident, as confident as you can be. And yes, there's lots of pneumonias we never get in organisms, because people don't cough and produce a specimen. And then you're doing your best to guess what antibiotics to give them, okay? Educate them. Okay? Pneumonia is a really hard topic, and all the, all the recommendations are changing and evolving, <coughs> and it really depends on our floor in the hospital. That's why we print that antibiogram and look at it religiously. I do sit down with micro and pharmacy every year to look at the antibiogram, and it does change what recommendations we're giving you to use empiric therapy, because it depends on what's been going on in the ICU 
in that time period. So we want to make sure we give our patients the best antibiotics that they need. But if they don't need antibiotics, we don't want to give them antibiotics. Okay? Okay. So, here we go. This is, this is actually a lady that I saw in the ICU with some of you. Mm -hmm. This isn't her fault, this is just me. 30 year old um, healthy obese woman, acute onset of fevers, chills, dry cough, myalgias of three days duration. And I can tell you that we saw this lady in, I think it was uh, February. Okay? And she saw her PCP on day number two of illness and was treated with ZPAC. Of course, the ubiquitous ZPAC, also way over prescribed, right? So anybody who comes into their PCP and has a two day history of illness, what is that illness likely to be? Is it likely to be bacterial? No, it's not likely to be bacterial at all. So here, patient's got completely unnecessary z pack she didn't need, right? And we know that bronchitis and viral infections are one of the most over-prescribed reasons that PCPs over-prescribe antibiotics because patients come in and they want something. Treat me, doctor, I want something. And we're hoping to change that culture so patients don't do that, but they do. And her husband and children were all ill the week prior to onset with similar symptoms, but they all got that. Okay? Sounds like flu, doesn't it? Sounds a bit like flu. So acute onset, it's in February, everybody else is sick, She's morbidly obese. Remember, morbidly obese patients do worse with influenza than other folks in general, especially with H1N1. Now she's really bad. She deteriorated. She goes to the IC she goes in the ED. She goes to the ICU. She's hypotensive, tachycardic, tachypnic, high-grade fever, right? Hypotensive. She's got bilateral rales. She looks sick. Chest X-ray shows bilateral infections. She ends up intubated and sedated on pressors, and her white cell count is 4.5 no left shift, and she's going for panic. So that's something we often look at. That's a little clue to viral infections, too, apart from the history. Her history is just glaring, right? And the history was not obtained. We didn't get the history from her because she was intubated when we saw her. The husband told me, oh, everybody had the same exact illness she did, you know, with acute onset illness, flu, 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 flu. But this does help you tell, sometimes it helps you she just look and see if it's a viral infection. She was already in renal, we had renal impairment. She got vancopine. In, in the ED, of course, their favorite too, everybody's favorite. And you see the patient the following morning, and she's on Levo, same bed settings. So we talked about this is likely to be a viral illness, right? Now, one, one of the things that I, I remember having, I can't remember who saw this patient with me, um, but I remember talking to the IC team about this, and the, the question I had was, but she's too sick for flu. It can't be flu, she has to have a bacterial infection because she's too sick. So what do you guys make of that? <laughs> Yeah, so flu is a, is a systemic illness. You can get renal failure, you can get hypotension, you can look like you're in septic shock. But remember, her illness is of very short duration. So the odds of this woman having a superimposed bacterial infection, it's all about the history, right? She's only been sick for two days. It's not bacterial, okay? It's not bacterial. She is sick from flu. It can cause renal impairment. It can cause myocarditis. It can even cause encephalitis, right? People die from flu every year, and what they die from is multi-system organ failure, usually, from influenza. So influenza is not, you know, not your home influenza like I got sick and had my allergies for a few days and stayed off work. This is true influenza that we see, and that's who dies of influenza. Okay? So what tests would you do to confirm your diagnosis of influenza or other viral illness because it's in the Light of fire. <laughs> okay, so here's the exciting news. So uh, we just, we're, we're going to get our flu vaccine in early this year. They say we're going to get our first 20,000 doses in the week of August 22nd. We just had our system immunization meeting yesterday. So we're going to be starting immunizing probably in early September this year, which is way early for us, yes. If you can get the flu there and then that year, are you starting to worry about when you can use the flu for the people that are going to Yeah, so, so first, yeah, th that's a very good question, and it's asked very common. So first of all, um, flu isn't happening later and later. Last year was a particularly late flu season. Remember, we put out that directive saying, hey, still think about flu, and it was June, and I saw a case in July that had influenza. So it's like, come on, we just got over last year, and now we're getting in flu vaccine for this year. So there's, there's very good data that the earlier you vaccinate, the better. Because some years, you get influenza starting in August and September, and we never know when Michigan when it's going to hit. So it's not true that it's generally drifting later. So if you look at the year before, for example, we started to see severe influenza in October. Right? This could, that last year was weird. We started seeing a big spike in like February, and then it lasted to June. It's like, you know, it's the middle of summer. What the hell are you doing with influenza? But remember, there's influenza prevalent in the community the whole year. So you can even see cases in the middle of summer, um, even if there's not. So the recommendation is, is in, immunized as soon as you get vaccine. Because it takes how long? 
between the time you get immunized and the time you reach maximal protection? A couple of weeks. So especially patients who have severe cardiorespiratory problems or are morbidly obese or children, you want to get vaccine into them as soon as you possibly have it. So that are, and patients often ask that, and that's a good question. No, immunity lasts for the whole season. Okay, so, soon, so you all should get your vaccine as soon as we release it to the rest of us. It should be soon. Hopefully we get it right this year. Yes, hopefully we get it. <laughs> hopefully the, um, it's a good match this year. So each year the flu vaccine targets are determined months ahead, so by February. And what it's based on is the surveillance done in the southern hemisphere, but there's all these surveillance centers mm -hmm. looking at influenza strains, and so it's the best guess of what will be in the vaccine. It takes months to make the vaccine, which is why when H1N1 came, which was a, a mutated strain, we just couldn't get vaccine out quickly enough because they couldn't manufacture it quickly enough. It's a slow process. So all these decisions about what's going to be for this 2016-17 season is made back in February by the WHO and others, and then the vaccine starts being manufactured, and that's why it becomes available usually in August or September. So these decisions sort of can't be reversed once they're made. They're sort of set in motion, and that's what the flu vaccine consists of. In some years, it's not a good match. In some years, it's a fabulous match. Last year was not such a good match. Okay, so we t the other exciting thing is that remember how we, we do influenza antigen, and remember it's only helpful if it's positive, right? Yeah. So it's falsely negative 40% of the time. That's a lot. It's almost a right? Helps if it's positive, you know the diagnosis. Remember we used to send out our PCRs? Well, good news, we're in-house now, okay? PCR for flu is way, way cheaper than BioFire, which gives you all that information I'm going to show you. But it gives you all these viruses. Okay, most of which are completely untreatable, except for influenza. Okay, and most of the time we don't need to know, unless it's a transplant patient or something else that we want to, you know, pick some weird antiviral regimen. So most of the time you don't need a biofire. I forget the cost of the biofire, two, 200 something? Yeah, a couple hundred bucks versus, I think it's about 40 bucks for a PCR. So um, last year, you know, everybody was kind of getting around doing the PCR and sending it out because it was taking a couple of days and I know it was painful. We were going to the same problem process. It wasn't the lab's fault. They had everything in place. They just didn't have everything. It was an outside company that didn't have everything in place for them. But now we have it in-house. So if you're thinking flu, don't go straight to BioFire, please, because it costs a lot of money. Please do the, the PCR first. You should get the result back the same day. Okay, and you can be on the, on the same specimen. And then if you really need to know, and you really need the BioFire, again, you don't have to poke the patient again. It can all be done on the same specimen. Okay, so exciting innovations from our lab this year. Okay, so hopefully that'll turn around the time and make everybody way happier. But BioFire, we're, we're definitely restricted to inpatients. Some of your patients, you know, you may want to know. And the other reason to sometimes know is because then that gives us a good argument to come and say to you, she doesn't need antibiotics, right? She's antiviral, but she doesn't need antibiotics. I'm sorry? Yeah, so Procalcitonin, we've looked at and we've actually evaluated it with, with the actual critical care staff. A couple of years ago, we all sat down in a room with Bruno and us and, and said, anybody interested in using procalcitonin? And, and there was a resounding, not really. So it's quite an expensive test. It would be a send out. And you really need to turn around very quickly. And it really, we figured it wouldn't really help. So patients were clearly it's bacterial and septic. We all, we all pretty much agree on those patients. It's patients where you're just not sure or whether you can de-escalate. So some healthcare systems use it more as a de-escalation agent. We are talking about re-looking at procalcitonin again, but we, right now we're not using it. And, and i got to tell you, if you do it now, it's going to be useless because you need it back the same way. And right now it's the same way. So we have, there wasn't a lot of interest in it. If you're very interested, you could do a little project study uh, using procalcitonin. We've talked about doing a little study in the IC. If anybody's interested in that, we'd be, we'd be receptive to helping you set that up um, And if you want to do that. Um, but we, we want to re-look at the literature again. And if you want to come to our meeting, um, where we look at that, you'd be very welcome. Just let us know and we'll include your name on the email. But we, we said we would look at it again. Okay? Unfortunately, it's not as good a test. It's not, there's no magic test. I wish there were. I would really wish there were. Okay, so any questions about where we're putting BioFire? So BioFire, still flu antigen, even though it's not a good test, followed by PCR in-house. And if it's turnaround times, so let us know and let the lab know because there shouldn't be turnaround times now. And then BioFire for a very special patients. Okay, but don't use the biofire just to get the food thing that quicker, like we're all doing last year. Okay, what did I skip there? Okay, so the discussion we would be having, and this lady actually passed away, um, 
She actually improved with influenza. We persuaded the ICU team to stop all of her antimicrobials. She clearly had flu. They gave her very big doses of Tamiflu. Very hard to know. Uh, dosing is difficult in people who are obese. And she actually got better from her flu. And then maybe a week or so later, whoever called us back and it looked like she had perforated belly, had dead gut. She'd been on pressures for a while. She would like Caitlin Scott High and she passed away. So influenza is still a formidable foe and that we're not very good about treating it. Okay. Then this is the last case, I think. 56-year-old woman from outside hospital. Alcoholic cirrhosis, urinary tract infection, morbidly obese. Alcohol abuse. Here's her cultures. Her urine had pansusceptible E. coli. Oh, so nice when we see pansusceptible E. coli. We're so happy. Her repeat urine had greater than 100,000 candid parapsilosis. Blood cultures were negative. Tracheal aspirate, yeast, GPCs and pears, and a few candida albicans in culture. So lots of yeast with this lady. She's a yeasty lady. So she's intubated and on uh, norepinephrine, transferred on zosin every eight hours, vancomycin and fluconazole. So what's the differential diagnosis in this one? I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So she could have fungemia, right? This is exactly the person that you should think about mm -hmm. having fungemia. So what are her risk factors for having fungemia? Two sites. Yeah, she's got two sites that are colonized. She's in septic shock. Yep, so what does that give her for a candidate score? About three. Three, three. three. gives her three. And what, what else would it take to bump her up even higher on the candidate score? Uh, TPN. TPN. How many points do you get for TPN? Good. And what else? Mm. Surgery, yeah. So strictly speaking, it's mainly abdominal surgery for risk, mm -hmm. but we, we, we see these are only guidelines, so if someone has a lot of other surgery, we would allow that as a one. Right, remember they're just guidelines. So you'd certainly think about that, and she's, a, and she's in septic shock, okay? So what tests might you consider ordering for? <laughs> yeah, so so we do still have some sort of criteria for T2 testing, which is also quite expensive. And so we are trying to still limit it. Again, clinical judgment supersedes our guidelines. But this woman has a high candidate score. No, no, no one of us would tell you not to do T2 on her. And concomitantly, that start her initial function because she's at high risk. Right, and this is a bad diagnosis to miss, and people do badly with with miss uh, fungi. And you'd probably give this woman also blood spectrum antimicrobials, right? Because she's really sick. We don't have a source. Although she's been on antibiotics for a while, we we're not told how long for. If this woman had been on antibiotics for a week or so, and had been a while, we might say to you, "Hey, you better escalate her up, because if this is bacteria, while well, waiting for all the other cultures, blood cultures, sputum, everything else, she's probably worn through her zosin by now." She's still sick. So this is a woman I would give very high, very broad spectrum coverage to if she came to you. But I'd look carefully at how many days. If she was just started on Zosin yesterday, I'd give Zosin a little while to work. But if she's been on it for seven days or ten days or twenty days at the outside hospital, then I'm thinking it's not so much working anymore. Okay? So you you guys, I'm really pleased you all know the Kansas score. We've we've pounded it into just about all of us from the few scores that I can remember. Okay? It's actually very helpful. It's been it actually came from the, the critical care literature, not the ID literature. Um, there are some flaws in it. It's not a perfect scoring system, like, and none of the uh, scoring systems are perfect, but it's what we're currently using now. So remember that uh, the T2 is a combination of kind of PCR plus MRI technology combined. Um, you, it, it happens very quickly, and you get the result that grouped by category of candida, right? Um, very quickly, within a few hours. And its negative predictive value is fabulous. So you can be very reassured, as opposed to procalcitonin, you can be very reassured if there's a negative test that person probably doesn't have on Okay? So, uh, yes? Yeah. 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 So we're using this as a surrogate. So we know that blood cultures are not very good for these. That's the problem. So we know from autopsy studies, previous autopsy studies, hopefully not from our patients, that people died with this uh, previously unsuspected anti-mortem uh, disseminated candida. And that's what you're trying to avoid. And so people try to look at what are the risk factors over the years. And as anti-fungal agents became safer, because before the choice was you give them amphotericin and knock off their kidneys, or you do nothing. And so but we know that there's a substantial number of people that die in the ICU with disseminated candida. So 
So how do you do that? Because unless you're lucky, the blood culture is going to be negative. Mm -hmm. So this is a surrogate marker. So if you see this positive, it means the patient has disseminated candidiasis and they should be treated for two weeks. <coughs> Disseminated with, with, if you don't have a source that you have to remove, like a line or something, they don't have endocarditis. So you're still going to look because they've got the T2 positive. You can treat it like a positive blood culture. So you're going to have it, have ophthalmology look at their eyes. Remember to wait four or five days because it takes a little while. Don't have them do it the same day. And you're going to get an echo, and you're going to, and at the same time as you've done the T2, because Epic does it for you, you can have drawn fungal blood cultures. So if they had sustained fungemia and you document they have fungemia, there's no need to repeat the T2. So if they if they just have one T2 that's positive, you're going to treat it as disseminated candidiasis unless you find another source or they have a blood culture that's positive or they have end up with so they have endocarditis. But we will treat it for two weeks. There, there are trials ongoing with the value of serial T2 MR, but it's, it's not ready for prime time. So until we know more about the value and even how long it's going to stay positive, it would just be based on presence or absence of endocarditis in two weeks. And this is, remember, this is also a very expensive test. I mean, it's a $300 plus dollar test. So we would not advocate repeating two teachers. And if somebody from pharmacy or ID tells you yes, please let us know because we want to know what, what, we'll, what messaging we'll, we want to try and be consistent with the messaging we're giving. But we would not advocate repeating the two We believe it. It's positive, it's positive. Yes? Um, the candidate, um, yeah, no, it doesn't. So candidate paraphrasis is usually is pretty susceptible. So you, we can actually do, we can't do MICs on a T2. You can only do it on a blood culture, right? But we know that they're generally very susceptible. The ones we worry about are the glutaratus. They usually have inducible resistance, and you have to, you can sometimes get around it by using a higher dose of an azole, but you won't know that until you get susceptibility. So, if the, so initial assumption would be the one that we would use for glutaratus. If the patient suddenly improved, um, and you were able to get a culture, or you could use one, in her case, you might be able to tell the level, gee, look at the glabrata from her urine, do the susceptibilities and tell me, is it susceptible? If it is, or sorry, where was that? Oh, she didn't have glabrata, sorry. If she had another, you might, you might ask the level susceptibilities and then use that as a surrogate for whether you could switch to the phone. Yes, it's pretty susceptible. Now, if the patient's acutely sick, there is some data that maybe everybody should be started on an Akinacan and then they do a function first and then downgrade. But if, down, if you knew the you know, patient's better and they're stable, yeah, I wouldn't have any hesitation in downgrading should be kind of a de escalate and should be downgrade. It's a good antibody. At the right dose, because she's 120 kilos. Right. So 400 so, is not enough. Yeah, this is where pharmacy <laughs> needs to help you because you would be using the equivalent of 400 to somebody else. Yes. So um, we're just going to finish up with how to, how to find everybody. I hope you all know on the Henry website, it's actually, they've rebuilt, it's actually way easier to use. So go to Henry, you type in whatever the heck you're looking for here. You can type in antimicrobial stewardship or antibiotics or just about anything and you will get to this page. And although it's really small, this will come up with the antibiograms, it'll come up with our empiric therapy guidelines, it'll come in up with who to contact, it'll come up with all kinds of useful information. And if you have nothing better to do, look there. Things like um, influenza guidelines, like what are we gonna, how are we gonna position things, it'll all be up there this year, okay? So check that out. And um, this is Rachel's, I'll let Rachel do this, but remember vancomycin, not good for pseudomonas. Um, vancopine, doesn't work for PEs. Um, remember, antibiotics are very precious. Don't use them up. And it makes us feel good, but it, they really aren't a warm fuzzy blanket. If Mike hasn't said these things to you on rounds yet, he will. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for having us. Well, because I was.